This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is one of the most instantly recognizable and beloved actors of our generation, who became known throughout the world as America's most reliable big brother, Greg, on the iconic TV show, The Brady Bunch. Although the original sitcom ended in 1974 after five seasons, The Brady Bunch has had phenomenal longevity and success. There were seven different TV series, two full-length feature films, five TV specials, a concert tour, three record albums, a stage play, a reality series, and countless Brady Bunch merchandising items and collectibles that are still very much in demand, especially the Brady Bunch lunch bucket. And no, you cannot have mine. It's not for sale. And get this, since its premiere on September the 26th, 1969, the Brady Bunch has never been off the air. The show has been broadcast in almost every country on earth, and each of the original 117 episodes has aired over 100,000 times, and for many years, it's been the highest rated program ever on Nick at Night. But well beyond the Brady Bunch, our guest has had a long and impressive career as an actor, singer, musician, dancer, and producer. He's appeared in dozens of classic TV shows, including Run For Your Life, Gomer Pyle, Mod Squad, Adam 12, Mission Impossible, Police Woman, Three's Company, and many more. He had recurring roles as Hannibal in General Hospital and Dean Strickland, also known as The Dean Machine in Hollywood 7, and who can ever forget him on season 32 of Dancing with the Stars and season 8 of The Masked Singer as one of the mummies. He starred on Broadway in Romance, Romance, and Pippin, and he appeared in stage productions of Grease, The Sound of Music, West Side Story, and City of Angels. On top of all that, he's a gifted singer and guitar player, and he plays in a band called Barry Williams and the Travelers, featuring his beautiful wife, Tina. His New York Times best-selling book entitled Growing Up Brady, I Was a Teenage Greg, is now in its third edition and was made into a TV movie which he co-wrote and co-executive produced. The book highlights the relationships, the behind-the-scenes stories, and especially the people who made the Brady Bunch so special to multiple generations around the world. In 1994, our guest was nominated for a Cable Ace Award for Best Performance in a Comedy Special, and he's received four TV Land Award nominations. And in 2007, he and his fellow Brady Bunch castmates won the TV Land Pop Culture Award. In 1989, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award as a former child star from the Young Artist Foundation. And for real Brady fans, our guest and Christopher Knight are the hosts of a highly popular podcast called The Real Brady Brothers. I'm delighted to welcome Barry Williams to our show. Barry, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be with you. And I really appreciate that wonderful and lengthy introduction. I'm going to go home now. <laughs> no way. I've waited too long to have you on the show. You know, I've heard it said by some people in the industry that no child is a born actor. And I believe Robert Reed even wrote that in the foreword to your book, he said the same thing. But you knew at the age of four that you wanted to be on TV. So don't you think you were a born actor? I think it came very early to me and I was very committed to it. And it seemed like like a very clear, clear connection for me. But the, the quick story on that was at four in kindergarten, one of my classmates was a, a little girl named Claudia Graves. Her father is Peter Graves. Peter was uh, current at that time doing a series called Fury, uh, a Western uh, that I watched every Saturday morning, later to go on to become the silver haired Mr. Phelps on Mission Impossible. I love that life that, that was presented on the, on the TV screen. And, and because of my connection with his daughter, met him a couple of times, asked him how he became an actor. He didn't take me very seriously, but he said, I thought about it. So I thought and thought and thought, finally convinced my parents to uh, 
let me have a shot. And my dad was a little reluctant. My mother, you know, was willing to bite the bullet, take me on the interviews, get the pictures. We found an agent, we studied. And the full circle to all of this, and just before the Brady Bunch actually happened, was I was hired to guest star on Mission Impossible with Peter Graves. And the mission was about I was played a king, and uh, the, the mission was to save me from my very evil uncle who wanted to steal my empire. So it was a a, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, full circle event. After your first TV appearance in Run for Your Life, and for a while after that, you seemed to be constantly cast on a bunch of TV shows as the troubled, runaway, delinquent kid with a heart of gold who came from a dysfunctional family. Were you surprised to be cast in those kinds of roles? No, I was surprised to be cast as Greg Brady <laughs> because I had the kind of the rebel uh, kind of sly, too, too, uh, uh, full of himself, uh, arrogant, kind of law-breaking attitude down well. I'd studied it. I knew what it was about, and I, and I felt I could deliver it. So very perceptive of you to see that the Brady Bunch character was really one of the first times I was playing an all-American kid. In Run for Your Life, the scene that I was doing with, with Ben Gazzara, the star, I started with me burning ants. In, uh, in in Mission Impossible, I was, you know, like I, I described, was I was, uh, you know, I had an entire kingdom in, fr in front of me. And in Dragnet, one of the shows I did with Jack Webb, I was caught stealing a painting from a church at Christmas time. So they were they were all, you know, uh, rebels and, and renegades and uh, lawbreakers and juvenile delinquents and things like that. And along comes the Brady Bunch. But I can tell you, I was very excited about the, the possibility of, uh, of taking on the role. So, and it worked out really well. Barry, at the age of 12, you appeared in a two-part episode on my good friend Robert Wagner's show, It Takes a Thief. What was it like working with him? One of the best professional experiences I've ever had. He was so good uh, with me. I've come on his set. I'm a big fan. Uh, it Takes a Thief was a huge show at the time. I was doing a two-parter with Joey Heatherton, who was my, my sister on that, and I was excited about that. And Robert treated me not as a kid and not as some someone who's in the way, but as a professional and, and as, as an actor. And we would work on the scenes, what happens, what was happening before the scene, what the purpose of the scene was. And I really appreciate it. I'll give you a quick example. He says, okay, Barry, you're going to come in, you knock at the door, and then you're going to come in the room. So what is the knock? What is that going to sound like? which I had not thought of, of course. And he says, well, what are you thinking about as you're coming into this room? Is it going to be a, a knock, knock, knock? Or is it going to be a tap, tap, tap? Let's find, let's find that reality that fits the scene. So it was a great learning experience and I appreciated being traded so respectfully. That's RJ. Yep. To a T. Now, when Sherwood Schwartz, who created the Brady Bunch, was asked why the children on the show never fell into the same dysfunctional lives that so many other child stars did, his answer was that when he was casting the six children, he was observing the parents as much as he was observing the kids. What did you think of that comment? I think it's accurate. And I think it's one of the things that created the kind of dynamic that we had in the show and the chemistry that we enjoyed to this day. Uh, during the run of our show, there were no divorces in any of the Brady kids' families. All of us had our own nuclear families to go home to. There were functioning families. There were supportive families. Sherwood wanted us to be kids because he wanted natural and he wanted he didn't want you know like actor kind of kids and he didn't want us to be restricted uh, uh, as you hear so many times the studios control the outside activities like horseback riding or ice skating or going skiing or surfing or any of that that could work the kids could be injured and miss work that never happened in our show the parents and the mothers were encouraged to be on the set and be a part of what was going on and so that combined with the six of us being able to support one another while we went through this huge upheaval of our personal lives as we became recognizable and 
and uh, and and the obligations became uh, in, increased throughout the, the run of the show, I think really helped us become much, much better adjusted as adults. Well, Sherwood also said that in casting the children for the show, the most important quality he looked for in a child actor was attention span. He really had great instincts, didn't he? Yes, he did. Here's one. Do you know who the first person cast in the Brady Bunch was? You. Susan Olson. Oh, Susan. Susan Olson, who played Cindy. And what Sherwood did was he had toys that were on the on his desk. And so he wanted to see which one she would pick up. She was only six, seven years old. <laughs> so which one she would pick up, what she would have to say about it. And he she was so natural and so uh, and so engaging and and inquisitive and that he, he instantly knew that that was going to be his Cindy Brady. Now, in your book, you wrote a lot about the animosity between Robert Reed, who played your father on The Brady Bunch, and the producers and writers of the show. It's well known that Robert Reed did not like the writing and didn't enjoy being in the show. How did his negative attitude affect you and the other child actors and the ambiance on the set. Well, for the most part, that was kept independent of uh, of the times that the kids of, of which I was one w were on the set. So most of the most of those disagreements, most of those uh, creative arguments, uh, happened in offices or at times when it, only the adults were were on the set. So we weren't exposed to a lot of it. However, Robert Reed fought very heavily for some kind of believabilities, for some kind of reality uh, in the scenes and in the scripts. And so as actors, we were learning from him about that, how to really think things through and not just take them for granted. So uh, it affected us in that way. And it's really important to, to, to understand the difference between the way he was in relationship with, with us kids and the way he was in relationship with the studio and Sherwood Schwartz uh, and network, they were very, very different. He really cared about us. And he really, he was paternal with us and he looked out for us. He protected us, but he came from a completely different style of acting. And uh, so he was in conflict with the much of the premise of the way in which the situ sitcom operated. He's a, a, a classically trained actor, a, a dramatic actor, as as evidenced by his career before and after the Brady Bunch, and he struggled with the kinds of jokes and situations and giving them allowance because they were m much of the time over the top and not believable to him, and he fought for reality. Well, over the years, Barry, you have steadfastly refused to take sides in the battle between Robert Reed and the show's writers and producers, and I respect that. But let me ask you this. Do you think Robert Reed's negative attitude about the scripts had the effect of making him a less important or a less prominent character on the show? Yes and no. I think it changed the dynamic of, of his role. He was very important. He was the patriarch and he was the one who, you know, had the lectures and, and delivered the message and, and gave the Brady's its real, its real brand, you know, how, how to behave in situations and what's fair and how to get along, which is really the whole point of the Brady Bunch is learning to get along. But it changed the way in which the scripts were developed. Instead of it being about two parents and how they handle this bunch of kids, this newly formed bunch of kids, it became about the kids having their situations and, th and their, learning, their learning process and then kind of learning from their parents about them. So instead of it being about mom and dad with kids, it became about the kids having a mom and dad. But Robert Reed directed four episodes of the show, and I find that shocking because he hated the writing so much. What was he like as a director? Uh, well, I don't know how any actor can direct themselves. It was awkward, I feel. I think it placed a lot of pressure on him. Uh, oh, he probably would have directed more, but he was so precise in everything that he did. And I think that was basically his biggest struggle 
was his perfectionism that you could see you could see how it was taking a toll on him a stress toll on him although i think i think he did very good episodes one of which was uh the one with Raquel the goat <laughs> that the Greg's the mascot that he stole from the other high school <laughs> Well, one thing I can't understand about Robert Reed is this. If he hated being on the Brady Bunch so much, why did he agree to be on the Brady Bunch variety show? Well, that's a good question. Originally, he was uh, for the Brady Bunch. Now, he was under contract to Paramount Studios. And the show that he came out to do to put him under contract went in an, another direction, a different type of casting altogether. And there was this Brady Bunch project floating around. So he felt, oh, well, I'm here. I'm under contract. This show has not a chance in the world of ever selling or going into a, you know, even doing a full season. So I'll just do that, take the money and sort of run. Once we had completed the five-year run and we all had these relationships and this idea of, of a variety show came around, he walked in and they weren't going to cast him. And he said, and by the way, Sherwood Schwartz did not produce it. So he said, uh, he told he told the network, and he says, nobody's going to play Mike Brady except me. I'm the father to those kids on television. That was it. So we had Robert Reed. <laughs> and I was grateful to have him. Well, I know that you remained good friends with Robert Reed for the rest of his life. And in mm -hmm. fact, you spoke with him two days before he died in May of 1992. I remember being really upset by what I considered to be very inappropriate and scandalous media coverage in the tabloids after Robert Reed died. Did that upset you as well, Barry? It did. Only because Robert Reed, uh, had, you know, he... He never had an agreement about talking about himself privately, his private life, his orientation. That was just not something that he wanted to share publicly and understandably. And of course, the tabloids really took off on uh, the complications of his uh, of his death and and made what they do. I mean, that's what tabloids do. But I think by that time in uh, in ninety two that. Uh, we were coming around to a different kind of understanding and another kind of tolerance and a, another kind of appreciation for uh, the struggles that, 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 that people faced with, you know, keeping these, these kinds of secrets and keeping these, this kind of uh, privacy. So I think everybody remembers Robert as the actor and uh, the patriarch and, and the, uh, and his body of work uh, more so than his, his uh, cause of illness. Oh, absolutely. I think that time has proven that that's what the public cared about, not his personal life. You know, when you consider the fact that the Brady Bunch remained immensely popular long after the series ended after five seasons, I'm wondering, Barry, do you think the network was wrong to cancel the show after the fifth season? <laughs> I always feel that if a show I'm in, it's canceled, it's wrong. <laughs> but uh, I... What I was frustrated with was they weren't letting us grow up. You know, I was 14 years old when we started the show, 20 when it went off, and it was time to go to college. It was time to move out. It was it was time to have my own storylines or my own struggles or be you know in a dorm or trying to find my way through uh, you know uh, upper uh, college or go off and do a career or something. All of us had changed, and the writers they were not going in that direction. They were trying to keep it very young and youth oriented. Hence. Uh, we they came up with the character of of cousin Oliver, who came to live with us, and he served kind of as a a humor mouthpiece and friend of Cindy and Bobby, and he was younger than both of them, to to add this kind of uh, uh, comedy and and humor that was not in line with allowing the Brady Bunch kids to grow up. So, if that being the case. I don't think there was really much of a choice. I, I, I think that they would, they just had to cancel it. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I want to ask you about the Brady Bunch kids concert tour, which I got to see in Chicago, by the way, oh, did you? you, you headlined with the fifth dimension. And at one point your opening act was Tony Orlando and Dawn. That crazy. 
<laughs> but I want to ask you, Barry, what did it feel like to be performing live on stage in front of your fans when you had only ever performed on a soundstage in a TV studio? Exciting as you can imagine. It was so much fun to do this. And we didn't even realize until we went out on tour the kind of impact that uh, th that our viewers would have in our lives. We had brought in, and that frankly was my idea, to to, to move and, and create opportunities, musical opportunities for the Brady Bunch cast. We ended up doing three albums. We did several tours. And that was the first time we'd gotten out of the soundstage and put these put uh, our our show and the music and live band you know in front of thousands and thousands of people these were uh, you know state fairs and we uh, were down at Atlantic City we our, the very first show we did was uh, at Caesar's Palace and uh, with Ed Sullivan so it was an exciting period and the fans gave us a lot of reinforcement they were you know very very excited and you know it's a, a teenager's for me it was a teenage kind of like dream well it was a dream for your fans too i know that i was an only child and i wanted you to be my big brother i just i am i just <laughs> loved you. I, <laughs> Thank I, you i i want to read you something barry that you wrote in your book which i found really interesting and about becoming a teen idol almost overnight you said i'm quoting you here once the Brady Bunch became a big success, people everywhere began encouraging us kids to branch out and become the true superstars they said we were so obviously destined to become. They kept saying, you're going straight to the top. When you're 17 years old and you start hearing that kind of stuff all day, every day, you start swallowing it wholeheartedly, at least I did. I really thought superstardom was simply there for the taking. And so I jumped head first into whatever project my persuaders dangled in front of my nose. So Barry, looking back, is there anything you wish you had done differently back in those days? Boy, I, it, what, what a gift experience is, perspective and context. There's no way to know what, what people who have their own agendas are doing when they're you know encouraging this or 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 telling you you know it's like it's like from the episode Adios Johnny Bravo where they they want you to become a star uh, and and change your sound and change your look and change your attitudes and tell you what to say and and create publicity that doesn't have anything to do with you and assign it to your character your personality because you fit the suit <laughs> and it's simply not realistic that's uh uh, I, I did jump in, and uh, uh, I, but I, I regrets. No, I, I mean, I just I, I was doing the best, and always have done the best that I could do. The smartest thing I, I did, and what I'm the most proud of in my career, is to diversify. So I wasn't uh, reliant on one medium, like television, for instance. Uh, I branched out into into a. a uh, theater. I moved to New York. I, I did tours and a lot of them and I paid dues and and musicals and I had music in my life. So, and I was and I was continuing to work somewhat in television, sometimes in features, sometimes uh, on stage. But I always had something that I could go to that would keep me busy and involved and to evolve. Well, that's because you're so versatile. You have the talent to be able to do that. Now, of course, over the years, you've been asked a lot about the benefits and the drawbacks of being a child star. We've had a lot of former child stars on our show. Billy Moomy, Angela Cartwright, Butch Patrick, Kathy Garver, Todd Bridges. We just had Michael Fishman from Roseanne on the show. But I must say that, in my opinion, nobody has articulated the issues better than you did in your book. You raised two extremely insightful questions. The first one was this. Is it worth the price of foregoing childhood interests and activities to get a start on a career? What's the answer to that question for you? Was it worth the price? For me, it absolutely was. I've never regretted a minute of it. To this day, I'm just as excited about getting to the studio or on the stage or to do what I'm there to do. Uh, recently, as you mentioned, I, I was invited to be to compete in dancing with the stars loved every minute of it hardest job i've ever had worked worked hard my knees paid for it and uh, but i wouldn't have traded it for anything 
But it's important to understand that there is a trade-off. It's not, I hear people say, oh, no, I just had a normal childhood. It is not a normal childhood. And there are sacrifices to be made. And there are holes that are created in, in developing as, as, as a person, as an, into an adult, uh, socializing for instance, was sacrificed almost across the board. I didn't know I didn't know how to social. I didn't know how to talk to make friends or to keep friends or to uh, relate really to people my age. I'd been relating to adults my whole time. I wasn't in regular school. My, my classes were coming from my my public schools and, and but I was studying by myself or with Maureen McCormick, uh, you know, in a room with a with a private tutor. I wasn't going to the Friday night football games. I wasn't hanging out. I wasn't uh, you know, uh, you know, just going on a, a date. I was always working. So for me, yes, it worked. My choice, I wanted it. I led the way. I'm, I'm still happy. No regrets. What I see over and over, and every one of those people that you mentioned that you've had on your show recently, I, I know or have crossed over with or had spent time with, that when you have someone else you know, that is leading that way, let's take the, you know, the stereotypical stage mom who is vicariously trying to live out their failed modeling dreams or their failed acting dreams through their child, different story. And if it's not your choice, you don't know what you're missing until later. And that's where the problems can, can come in. So my answer is for me, it, it, it worked because, because that was my choice and that's what I wanted to do. And I was the leader of that, of that move. But for kids that are resisting it, and as I also point out in my book, I think that the real acting comes when you've had experience. As a 12, 13, 14-year-old kid, you just don't have enough experience yet. I say, get your education, finish your high school, get to have friends, ha have that sort of normalcy, and then bring your life experience into the work. Yeah, that's good advice. The The second question you asked in your book was, does a career as a child actor provide a solid foundation upon which an adult acting career can be built? And your answer to that question was fascinating, Barry. You said, the greater success you have as a child, the more typecast and locked in you get, and the harder it is to break out of that and establish yourself as an adult actor. So I want to ask you, have there been times in your career when you wished that you had not played such an iconic character like Greg? Yes, uh, there have been times. And particularly immediately after the show ended. Very quickly, I'm gonna, I will answer your question, but keep in mind. I'd come off this big, big show. We got canceled. No one expected it. We were, we were told we were going to be picked up for a year. That was on a Friday. On Monday, I went in to pick up my things out of my dressing room. And the guard, who I knew, Fritz, who had been there for the last six years that I was there, every morning, wouldn't let me on the lot. I got to my parking space, where, uh, which was next to my dressing room. And the parking space, where my name had already been painted over and had a new name on it. And I didn't have a parking space anymore. That was in two days. I got I got the message very very quickly. When you come on uh, as a and become known as as a child actor, people think that's who you are, and they have a lot of difficulty trying to see you as every anything else. More importantly, it's hard for anybody who's doing the casting to see you as something different than what they already know you from. So you've got a couple of things that are not, are working against you. It can be overcome, as we've seen. Leo Di Leonardo DiCaprio, for instance, Justin Timberlake. There, there are lots of examples. Ariana Grande was a child star and it becomes superstars. But it's very, very, very difficult. And the <laughs> if, if the odds can become more astronomical, <laughs> by being known as a child as a star then then without then that's that's what happens so i think you have to really almost reinvent yourself uh after after that to become uh to, you know to cross over into feature films or actually move up into having your own television series or or the like i find a lot less of that prejudice in stage acting 
where you know you're actually you know one on one and one with people. But in television, a lot of it is imaging, and it is uh, it is difficult to overcome. Well, I was very impressed. Speaking of being typecast. You certainly did manage to break out of the Brady Bunch image in 1984 when you had a recurring role on General Hospital. You played an English con man by the name of Hannibal. Did you enjoy that? Of course. Of course. Back to being a being a rebel again. You know, I was lying to all the ladies of Port Charles and telling them I'll make them stars and and uh, fleecing them for money and and payments. And then I put them on a bus to nowhere. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> In 2008, you shocked the world by appearing on a VH1 TV series called Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew. You were on the show as a friend of one of the patients, and you explained during a group session how drinking had had a negative impact on your life. You didn't really delve into that in your book, so I was surprised by that disclosure. Did you have a serious drinking problem at one point in your life? Well, depends on how you define problem. The reason you don't see it in the book is because I was pretty ter- uh, period specific about what I wanted to include. This, uh, you know, the Brady, the, uh, growing up Brady was not like a tell-all book of my life. But growing up Brady was a, t- a tell-all of, about the filming of the Brady Bunch and who the characters were that that made it and and some opinions about it. Uh, the, uh, you know, drinking uh, for me uh, at w- one point was was uh, f- frequent. Like every day, and then there there came a point where it uh, it's it just stopped working, and so yes, I would say that there was there was a time when uh, I I needed to kind of take a look at that and 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 moderate it because it, it made it harder to get going in the morning and and to to really have uh, full attention and to start taking a look at what it was I was trying to anesthetize myself from, and uh, one of them was not being able to break out as a movie star. <laughs> which I thought was going to happen immediately. Well, my heart really went out to you on that show. I think you really helped a lot of people understand the challenges that you went through. And, you know, a, a lot of people assume that because the Brady Bunch still airs regularly on television, that you and the other Brady kids are making millions of dollars in residuals. But that's not true, is it? No, uh, residuals uh, for for the Brady Bunch ran out quite um, before the show even ended, practically. So there was a there was a little bit of money there. Where we have been fortunate economically with the Brady Bunch are the reunions you discussed, and I, I and and the way that I, I I express that is there's a big difference uh, between when you really want a job with the network and when the network has to have you. <laughs> You know, much better bargaining position, and so, for instance, in in uh, in the late '80s, when we did a very Brady Christmas, a very Brady Christmas, we made all of us, each of us, uh, made more money doing that one two-hour special than the entire five years of doing the show. So, the, the, through the the subsequent, it's been good to us financially, but not through residuals. That said, if I could have a nickel for every time the show aired, I would take the nickel and do the rest of it for free. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. You worked with the other Brady Bunch kids in the 2019 reality TV series, A Very Brady Renovation. And then yes. in 2021, you appeared with them again in the Lifetime Christmas movie, Blending Christmas. Right. Uh, what's it like to work with them again? Well, in a, in a sense, we're never very far out of touch. So we have, uh, we're very familiar. It's like, you know, it's putting on an old hat. The HGTV, sh- uh, it, it, that was a whole series. Uh, they were going to make it one show about re- renovating the Brady Bunch house, uh, turned in on nine different episodes. It was very highly rated, very good for uh, for HGTV, the highest rated shows they'd ever had. And we were even nominated for a uh, best reality show for an Emmy for that. Great fun, and it was great fun to be there not playing our characters. So here we were on television re- remodeling the show, but but as Barry, as Maureen, as Jan, uh, I mean Jan, as Eve, as being just who we were and our reflections of it. So that was that was very unique and, uh, and a lot of fun. The Lifetime show came along uh, subsequent to that, probably because they saw what we did for HGTV. And 
uh, and, and put us into a different kind of format. We were we were Brady's, uh, but we weren't related and we weren't playing Brady's. <laughs> do you get, I mean, deep down inside, do you get how beloved and popular you are? Yes. I do. What does it feel like? To know that when we look at you, we see the 14-year-old. Yeah. We want you to be part of our family. We trust you. We like you. What does that feel like? I'm grateful. Very grateful. But connected. It's it, For me, it's like having an extended family. But that's like international. Wherever I go, there's a connection. People are interested. They invite me over to dinner. I live in a little town in the middle of America called Branson, Missouri. When I go into breakfast for myself at a coffee shop, people come in that I don't know, and they just sit down and start having coffee with me. And it's a privilege to have that kind of entree into people, especially if, you, if you're interested in them and, and, uh, and they share their lives and their stories. And those connections are, are precious to me. So I would say what it feels like is it's gratifying because it's a, in, it's, a for, it's a form of success in life. And I'm grateful. I think it's wonderful that you've managed to embrace the fact that you can't really be separated from Greg. And yet we all know that you're your own person. You've had lots of other big accomplishments. Oh, I want to ask you about your podcast, The Real Brady Brothers. Yeah. What what inspired you to do that? We call it the uh, the real Brady Bros, as in brothers. The real Brady Bros. Uh, Christopher Knight, who played Peter, and I, uh, he he had actually called me and said he's done some research and it seemed that there were some interest in people doing what are called episodic recaps. So an episode is recapped in the form of a podcast, and he wanted me because I wrote the book to uh, to share in doing just that. And so we put together this podcast where each of us were in different places at where we live, and we would select an episode. We would watch the episode. We would take copious notes, share those notes, read them, and then get together, like as in a Zoom, and then go through the episode in minutia what we remembered, who the guest stars were, what the guest stars are doing now, what it was like, the differences in our memories. We were at different stages of our lives. He's three, three and a half years younger than I. So yeah, what, what meant something to him in one way was very different from, from my own. And we have done 90 of these now and out of 117. And we've had a great time. It's kind of cathartic for us. In many cases, we neither one of us has watched a full episode that we're recapping. And so to bring it kind of full circle and talk it through and engage with our fans, it's also a Facebook page, Real Brady Bros. And there's a lot of interactivity about that. People ask questions. We do whole podcasts answering their questions, as well as the episodes. It's become popular and enjoyable for us to do. And we're, we're going to stick with it and get all 117 episodes and sit back, take a breather, and then see if we're going to continue with maybe, I don't know, the uh, the, the, the uh, specials that, that followed that or or uh, different or different things, or, or maybe have more guests. We had Danny Bonaducci on recently. We've had uh, uh, Susan Olson on. We've had Eve Plum on. We've had Michael Lookinland on. We've had uh, Susan Cowsill come on, so we've had uh, different d different guests, and maybe we would take it off and and make and spin it off into uh, you know uh, child stars, for instance. Well, when you watch an episode of the show, what runs through your mind? Well, now it's like home movies, and I get to sit back and watch it and in enjoy it for its entertainment value. I'm detached enough from it; it's far enough in the history now that I, I don't feel self-conscious about it. I, I, I watch the work. And frankly, I do like some episodes more than others. I talk a lot about that. And some of them I like. I just, I just this morning finished watching Adios Johnny Bravo, where Greg is going to be made into this, you know, this, this faux teen idol. 
And I thought, wow, that was a pretty good episode. You know, everyone did, did their jobs well. It was funny. It had a nice moral. It all came together in the end in a very Brady fashion where Greg decides not to go off on a solo career because he's not being represented as true to himself, that he really loves his brothers and sisters. And the whole show wraps up with us back with me back in the band and, and singing another song. And so what goes through my head is, is, is looking at what the, the entire series was about. And in a sentence, it's a learning how to get along. That's the whole point of, of the Brady Bunch learning how to get along. And I think that's something that uh, is not a bad legacy. Not at all. It's a wonderful legacy. My favorite episode was the one where my big brother, Greg, was surfing in Hawaii and almost died. May, may I just say, and I know we didn't plan this, you know, but. <laughs> oh, my Lord. There it is, folks. <laughs> I keep this tiki around because I'm oftentimes in this same room, the same space doing cameos. And people ask about that that episode, about being in Hawaii and getting to surf. Some people don't even know I was doing my own surfing, which I was. And it was the wipeout that wasn't faked. <laughs> that was a real wipeout. So uh, I ha that's why I happen to have this around. And so sometimes I'll you know, I'll put it on, wear it, you know, while we're talking about the episode. <laughs> yeah, you're giving me palpitations. But <laughs> you mentioned the cameos. Please tell us how people can get a cameo from Barry Williams. It, that's the easiest thing in the world. It's uh, cameo.com, Barry Williams. You know, did, uh, go in and 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 sign up and, and ask for one. They'll take you through all the steps. This is... We're talking about connection. This is one of the ways that technology has really, really improved and increased the ability to connect. It's like being my uh, my own personal Hallmark card. So uh, I, I'm there to do video messages, personalized video messages for friends or to the people who ask for them themselves, shout outs. They include birthdays, anniversaries, uh, graduation, pep talks, retirement for, for moms, for daughters, for sometimes anniversaries, Valentine's Day, all kinds, anything that you want to make special and that, that I might be appropriate to be uh, included on. And so I'll, I'll comment and, you know, wish people if they want it in Brady fashion or in that lingo to have far out and out of sight, uh, very Brady birthdays and wish them uh, sunshine days and to stay groovy and, you know, all of that kind of and, and play, be playful and have fun in a kind of nostalgic way. So all you Brady Bunch fans out there, if you're looking for something special that you want to surprise someone you love who's also a Brady Bunch fan, go to cameos.com and you can have a specialized message from Barry Williams, big brother Greg, directly to the person that you want to surprise. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Barry Williams, find out about his personal appearances, his band, buy his merchandise by going to his official website, barrywilliamsofficial.com. Well, Barry, I have only one more question for you, and it's really important because I need you to settle a bet. Are you ready? I Well, wait a minute. Can I have 10 percent? OK, you you, yes. <laughs> but I have to win. Yeah, you got to win. <laughs> OK, the question is, was Carol Brady a divorcee or a widow before she married Mike? Do you have a bet on this? Yes. She's a divorcee. I just lost. Oh, there goes my 10%. Let me explain. I'll do a cameo. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, great. The, let me explain. The, the network, when they read the script, Sherwood Schwartz, Sherwood Schwartz wrote, it was a widower and a divorcee. And the, and the network went out of their minds. They said, well, we love the show, but she cannot be a divorcee. And he said, yes, you can, because I wrote it, and that's who she is. And they never, ever agreed to settle that or bury that hatchet. So the network was always opposed to uh, proclaiming 
that Carol Brady was a divorcee. They didn't want to get into it. They didn't want to get into uh, visitation, what happened in the, uh, you know, about the marriage that caused them to be divorced. It, this show was designed for the Midwest. And, you know, that, uh, that divorcees, that doesn't go over well. And they were afraid that it would hurt v viewership. But it was very, very important because it was such a big problem. It's what created lots, so many latchkey kids in the late 60s and 70s. So the agreement was that we would never deal with it. We would never, we would never include it in the set, uh, on, in, on the screen. And the way that the network promoted the show always included her being a widow. So that's why uh, their father, the girl's father, was never talked about, and it was never, ever handled. It was handled with, on the boy's side, but not on the uh, Carol Brady. So she, was, she has a maiden name and a formerly married name, and then, uh, but that was it. And then, and another thing you'll, you'll notice is that immediately, we never said, stepbrother, stepsister. It was always my sister, my sister. It was always mom and always dad. You were never saying stepmom, that we just immediately became a family. And that was, uh, again, in partly in design about getting together. But in the, in the movie, uh, I think it was the second movie uh, of the Brady's, then they did bring it up. And then they had uh, an actor come in and play the, uh, f the, f her former husband. And he was not terribly likable. <laughs> I remember that. You know, I should have known she was a divorcee because she never referred to the children's father as being dead. No. So I should have picked up. Well, I got to tell you, Barry, it's been such a pleasure meeting you. I know that life hasn't always been easy being trapped in the persona of a TV character that you never intended to become your alter ego but you've handled it so beautifully. And because of that, I really believe that you've become woven into the fabric of Americana. And that's something to be very proud of. Thank you for all the joy you've brought to millions of people. And thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Well, you're very, very welcome. And thank you so much for including me in, uh, in your guest list. I enjoyed our talk very much. Me too. Our guest has been actor, writer, producer, and musician, Barry Williams. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Harvey, stay groovy. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.